don't you love the Gospel of John? Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed. I have this week, you know, reading through it again and uh, getting ready to uh, teach in this particular chapter, the 14th chapter. We're in that marvelous upper room discourse, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, where the Lord's in the upper room and he's, he's giving a long discourse of a number of teachings to those that are his own. Private ministry. The public ministry ended in chapter 12. Judas has left now and now it's just the Lord and his disciples, those that he loves and those that love him. A reciprocal love. And in the 13th chapter we saw what had happened. Uh, many teachings were given here and one of the things the Lord had to do at the end was to let Peter know, Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me three times before this day is over, before this night's over. And not only that, they had seen Judas leave. Not only that, in the 13th chapter, they had heard the Lord said, I will be betrayed by someone in this room. And then not only that, he said, I'll only be with you a little longer, and then where I go, you cannot come for now. Now, when all these things were settling upon them, they were troubled in their spirit. They were troubled in their soul. They were troubled in their heart. Now, from Jesus' standpoint, he had troubles of his own. <laughs> I mean, this was the night. This is the night he's going to be taken by the, uh, the, the, the Roman guards and by the temple guards, and he's going to be brought before a trial that he knows is going to be a false trial. He knows he's going to be crucified within the next 24 hours. He has troubles of his own, and yet, in the infinite mercy and compassion and love, he's worried about the troubles in his disciples' hearts. That's the type of God that we have. He's concerned about our problems. Our problems compared to his are like little itty bitty snowflakes compared to a, a mountain avalanche of the troubles he has to deal with. And yet still he's worried about our little snowflakes. He wants to melt those. What a blessing. So in this chapter, the Holy Spirit is going to paint a portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ as the great comforter. He's going to comfort the disciples in this chapter. Uh, through the chapter, working through it, Dr. Wearsby broke it down into five different ways that he's going to give comfort to them by showing certain things that he's doing and will do for them. In verses 1 through 6, he's going to comfort them by showing that he's preparing a place for them. In verses 7 through 11, he's going to comfort them by revealing the Father to them. In verses 12 through 14, he's going to comfort them by letting them know that he works through prayer and they will have the privilege of a prayer life that works. In, in verses uh, 15 through 26, he's going to comfort them by telling them he's going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And then finally, in verses 27 through 31, he's going to comfort them by letting them know that he will give them peace, even down here in this world of woe. What a blessing. So now as we work through it, why don't we look at the first uh, six verses and read and then comment and see how the Lord Jesus Christ is the great comforter. He begins in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go you know, and the way you know. But Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They're burdened. They're troubled. And so he starts, let not your heart be troubled. Now, right here in the upper room, he's speaking to disciples. He's speaking to those that love him, those that have professed faith in him and have followed him. And he wants to speak to them and he says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, where are you in your life? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you tried to follow him? Then the very same words apply to you. Let not your heart be troubled. So often as Christians down here, we find our hearts being troubled. And the great comforter would like to remind us, would like to bring our attention back, would like to turn our eyes back upon him and speak words of comfort, let not your heart be troubled. So the men are looking at him and they're wondering, why? 
should we believe what you've just said? Why should our hearts not be troubled? And so then he invokes the authority. He says, you believe in God? You believe in God, don't you? Now think about these Jewish men. He's, he's a Jewish Jesus in the form of a Jew. Come, the son of Joseph, uh, the son of Mary, according to the flesh of the seed of David, a Jewish man sitting with 11 Jewish men in a room. You believe in God? Well, of course the Jewish men believe in God. This is what set them apart from the nations of the world. God had revealed to them the scriptures. The scriptures, the oracles of God were given unto the Jewish people. And the oracles were to show the true and the living God. So from the time they were little, their, their parents had raised them. Fathers were to tell sons, who were to tell their sons, who were to tell their sons. From father to son, it was passed on in oral tradition and in the written sacred scriptures, the truth about the one God <coughs> of the universe. Not the pantheon of the false gods of all the false religions out there. And there were plenty of them. The Jews had wandered through Egypt. <coughs> they had come through the wilderness of Kadesh and Sinai. They had circled around by the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites. They crossed over Jordan and entered the land of Canaan where the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Girgashites and the Hittites had their false gods. There were false gods everywhere, but they knew the true God. And they believed in the true God. So he says, you know what? You believe in God? Then you don't need to have a troubled heart. That's the reason why you and I need not have a troubled heart. Now, it's interesting. A lot of people today, if we were to go out and take a poll at the mall, they tell you they believe in God. Lots of people believe in God. I would say the majority of this nation, I would say over 90% of this nation <coughs> says they believe in God. I believe polls have been done. Barn has done them. Atheists in this land make up less than 5% of the people. There are agnostics that aren't sure. But when you ask people that, I believe in God, 90% of the people believe in God. <clears throat> Around the world, there are great religions that have all their services. Billions of people have been tallied up. A billion people in Islam, a billion plus people in Roman Catholicism, hundreds of millions in the, in the various uh, Protestant denominations, people in Buddhism. And you go out and you ask them and they'll tell you of a higher power, they'll tell you of a God. Yet they have troubled hearts. Why? Well, Jesus is going to connect for these Jewish men the key ingredient, the key link that will allow them to go from just believe in God and having a troubled heart to believe in God and not having a troubled heart, and it's found in the last part of the verse, believe also in me. Believe also in me. See, your belief in God is a distant, far-off belief. There's no connection between you and God. You need to believe in me. Now, this is a revelation of incredible proportion to a Jewish man, <laughs> because you're telling a Jewish man to believe in a man. You're telling a Jewish man, apparently, to believe in a, a second God. Very difficult thing for them to get a hold of. Very difficult thing for you and me to get a hold of because it speaks to the, the mystery of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. The fact that there are three persons in one God. Look at what the Jews had been taught to recite over and over. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is something the fathers taught the children, and the children taught their fathers over and over and over. In verse uh, uh, 3, Deuteronomy 6.3, Hear therefore, Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. So the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they had told it to their sons. It's passing down to Moses. Moses wants to pass it to their sons. And here's what he tells them what they need to do. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. That particular verse, Deuteronomy 6, 4, that's called the Shema. That verse, they're required to recite three times a day. Morning, noon, and evening. Jewish people are, are required to recite that. Shema, Yisrael, 
Adonai, Elohim, Adonai. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. This is something over and over and over. God wanted to impress upon the Jewish people there is only one God of the universe. There aren't, there's not a pantheon, there's not a polytheistic universe out there with a God of the seas and a God of the, uh, the, the air and a God of the stars and a God of the trees and they had all different gods, all these polytheistic religions around them. There's only one hero, Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Now, these Jewish men had learned this well. This is what separated them from all the nations. And now he's saying, okay, you believe in God, sure, believe also in me. This is a new revelation. This is a mystery being revealed to them. But unless you receive this mystery, your heart will be troubled. Talk with a young man not too long ago from Somalia. <coughs> he worships God. He believes in one God. I tried to explain to him that the one God had a begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was also equal to the Father, did not compute. A, 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 a cutoff was made there. A disconnect occurred. I asked him, do you know your God? Oh, no. Oh, no, I don't know my God personally. Well, then your heart's going to be troubled. And Jesus is going to make the key connection here to these men. You need to take the next step now of faith. You need to go from God the Father to me the Son. Believe also in me. Then your heart won't be troubled. That's the step that has to be made. That's the step that had to be made in my life. I hope that's the step you've taken in your life. So the first thing he tells them is, you're believing in God, you need to believe in me. This is going to start to settle your hearts. Now let me tell you some things I'm going to do. Number two, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house. In the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Psalm 102, Ecclesiastes 5, Isaiah 66, Deuteronomy 2. Throughout the Old Testament, it was made plain and clear and evident that God did not live on earth with men, that he resided in a place far away called heaven. This is not any new revelation. They knew about heaven. They understood about heaven. The Father's house is heaven. That's where he resides. Uh, Solomon at the dedicating of the temple said, The heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. How can my little temple contain thee? God that inhabiteth eternity, Isaiah said. God is in heaven and men upon the earth. It's interesting. I talked with uh, a Jewish man recently and he was saying, oh, we, we, did, we didn't know that God's in heaven. We don't believe God's in heaven. That's not an Old Testament teaching. All that showed me was the incredible ignorance that people have of their own Bible. This is a Jewish man telling me, he had no concept that God resided in heaven. I'm just quoting Old Testament scriptures to you. They're not reading the Old Testament. I'm not surprised. I grew up a New Testament Christian, Roman Catholic. I never read the New Testament. I was ignorant of the New Testament. The guy from Somalia I was talking to, he's uh, Islamic. He was ignorant of his own Quran. I know because I've studied it a little bit and I pulled it out and I showed him a few verses in there he had never seen. He was stunned to see them. My observation is most people in religion just follow religion very loosely by tradition and have no idea what the religion teaches. They're not familiar with the books of their religion. So, <clears throat> the Father's house being heaven, some of the Jews aren't even sure of that today. But in the Old Testament, get the tape and listen, and run through the Psalms I just mentioned in Isaiah and Deuteronomy and you'll see that God lived in heaven. Now here's the thing, the Old Testament Jew was not expecting to go to heaven. That was not his expectation or his hope. Turn to Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Job is a perfect picture of the Old Testament Jew going through trial and tribulation. <coughs> perfect picture. Job is the 18th book of the Bible. 6 plus 6 plus 6. Job is a picture of what the Jews will go through in the tribulation. That's what it's a picture of. It's 42 chapters. There are 42 months in the great tribulation. It's a picture of that. Job is a picture of the Jew. Now notice the Jew and his hope. Uh, <clears throat> Job 19, picking it up in verse 25. He's going through all these problems and he says, you know, 
for I know that my Redeemer liveth. I may be dying with this illness, but I know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God right here in the earth. When he comes down to earth, I'm going to inherit the earth with him, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, behold him when I see him in my flesh and the latter day upon the earth. So the hope of the Old Testament Jew was to be resurrected in his body and to see God upon the earth. That was his hope. That was his desire. The day that God would send the Messiah and reign in Jerusalem and there would be the millennial kingdom. Turn after Job a couple books to the right to Isaiah chapter 65. The Old Testament Jew was looking for the resurrection to inherit the earth when God would stand upon the earth. That was what he was looking for. This is a brand new revelation in John 14 given to these Jewish men. They'd never heard anything like Jesus is teaching them. Uh, uh, from the Old Testament, we're seeing the Jew was expecting to be resurrected and live on the earth. Isaiah chapter 65. Verse 18. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Neither shall uh, there shall no more uh, thence be an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days going to live his lifespan. The child shall die in a hundred years, but the sinner being a hundred years old, he shall be accursed. So saying, if anyone dies at 100 years old, he'll be called a child. Boy, in those resurrection bodies living in the millennium, when someone dies at 100, you go, oh my, he's so young. He was just a child. Because when God comes back, they're going to live a thousand years. This is what they're looking for. This is what their hope was as an Old Testament Jew. Verse 21, and they shall build houses in Jerusalem, and they shall inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards. They shall eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. You know, trees live hundreds and hundreds of years. That's how long they're going to live. The hope of the Old Testament Jew was the resurrection body to live in the promised land for a thousand years with the Messiah. That was their hope. Not to go to heaven. And Jesus is going to change the whole thing here in John 14. Jesus is beginning a brand new economy. Not only are you going to believe in God, and not, now you're going to believe in God plus me, but your hope is no longer to live on earth a thousand years. Your hope is to go a new place to the Father's house. This is the beginning of the space age right here. Long before Cape Canaveral, okay, in the upper room, Jesus started the space age and told them, you guys aren't going to live here. You're going to live with me in my Father's house. This is a new teaching right here. Brand new. Right here. Brand new. It's not applying to Old Testament Jews because everyone in this room is going to get the new birth at Pentecost. Everyone's going to be born again. This is for born again Christians. And here's the promise that they're given. In my Father's house are many mansions. Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Okay? I'm not going to lie to you. There are mansions in my father's house. What is a mansion? I like the word. A mansion is the house of the Lord of a manor. M-A-N-O-R. A manor. A manor would be a, a land belonging to a nobleman or a lord. In the old days, they had spreads of land, large acreage like uh, Ponderosa. You know, and, and the three guys, the, the, the three 40 year old sons and the 50 year old father, what was it? What were their names again? I forgot. Haas, Joe. Haas and Joe and Adam and, and the father, Ben Cartwright. That's it. And they had, they had a manor there. Okay. Now, the way the manor was set up, they had servants on the manor. And the servants had other domiciles they lived in. But the lord of the manor lived in the mansion. The man, there was one mansion in a manor. That's the way it was. Jesus says, not in my father's house. There's not just one mansion for him to live in. There are many mansions. There are many mansions. What a deal. What a deal. You ever been in a mansion? I was in a small mansion once. One, one doctor friend of my father, he bought a small mansion on Nottingham Terrace. It was small by a mansion size, but still it was pretty big. The foyer was like 40 feet by 30 feet. That was the foyer. It was 40 feet wide by 30 feet 
long when you walked into the foyer. Then the living room was off that side of the foyer. The dining room was off that side of the foyer. A large st curved staircase went there with an elevator, just in case you couldn't make the stairs. And then the library was off that back side of the foyer. And the kitchen for the servants was off that back side of the foyer. That was the foyer of the mansion. That's a small mansion, I know, because we used to go down the street and saw some of the big mansions and say, boy, we'd like to get in those. That was one of the smaller mansions. And in the Father's house in heaven are many mansions for his people. And Jesus says, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, I won't send a messenger to come again to get you. I won't send a, a company of angels and a white horse or a chariot. I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself. The body of Christ being incorporated into its head. That's what he's going to do. This is a New Testament Christian truth given to those that are in Christ. Received unto Christ. This is not for Old Testament Jews. This going to heaven is a teaching for New Testament Christians. The Old Testament Jews are going to inherit the earth. They are going to get their resurrection body. They are going to live in earth. Christians are going to live in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ as the bride of Jesus Christ. And he's teaching this to them right here. I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Where is Jesus? Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Where is Jesus? Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14. Hebrews toward the back of the Bible. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. There he is. He's up there. Hebrews chapter 9. Same book. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands, like a church building with stained glass windows, or an Old Testament temple or a tabernacle. He didn't enter into that, which are figures of the true. But Christ has entered into heaven itself. Now, to appear in the presence of God for us. A couple books to the right of Hebrews. 1 Peter chapter 3. After Hebrews is James, then 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3.22. The resurrection of Jesus Christ ends verse 21. Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and he's on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You're going to heaven. First time the eleven ever heard anything like this. Never taught in the Old Testament. The concept that a human being would go to live in heaven didn't cross their mind. Oh, I'm waiting for the great resurrection, the resurrection of the last day, said Martha. Mary said, yes, we're waiting for the resurrection. She said, now I'm the resurrection and the life, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and where I go... There you may be also. I'll receive you to myself. The Lord Jesus is going to take him to heaven. And so he concludes in verse 4. He says, um, And whither I go, you know. And the way, you know. So the first thing he does to comfort those with heart trouble is to give them a very important new teaching. Number one, you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to have faith in God. It's not enough to have faith in God. If you're out there and you're just counting on your faith in God, it is insufficient. That may have worked in the Old Testament. You're in a New Testament, a better testament, a newer covenant that God has given in the person of Jesus Christ. You must have faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. If you want your heart to be no longer troubled. If you want comfort for heart trouble. The second thing that will comfort your troubled heart, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, is an assurance that the Father's house in heaven, the Father's house on high is going to be your eternal home. That's where you're going to spend eternity. What a deal. The third thing is that Jesus Christ himself is making the preparations. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm not leaving this in the hands of others. I'm not counting on my angels to do this. I'm not counting on the Old Testament saints and Moses and Elijah and Isaiah to do this. I'm preparing the place. He's going to make all the preparations. He's going to go to Calvary's cross. He's going to put away the sins of the world. He's going to make the preparations up in heaven as the carpenter. He's going to build fine mansions. Oh, man, it's going to be incredible. He's not going to be outdone by men. 
like that book we have that we showed when we were studying Revelation from the, the mansions in, in New, where's it called, Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, those incredible mansions there. You think God's going to be outdone? The carpenter's going to be outdone by someone on earth. We're going to get there and say, this is pretty neat, but you should have seen what they had in Rhode Island. <laughs> Rhode Island's going to look like an, an outhouse compared to what the Lord's preparing. Many mansions. And Jesus himself is going to come in person and receive every one of his children to himself and then be with that person forever in heaven. There's some four good things for troubled hearts. Beautiful teaching. I think we get on the chapter right there. But Thomas, uh, a materialist, a rationalist, one who went to high school, one who's from Missouri, the show me state, <laughs> says, you know, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? How can we know the way? Probably a good question. I might have asked the same thing, because it took me a long time to figure this out. I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about there. And, and how would I know the way? And Jesus then plainly says to him, verse 6, one of the great verses in the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. A great threefold truth that Jesus wants to give here. Now, Jesus is the last Adam. I'm going to take a look at something that uh, I found in a commentary by Pink, and it was very interesting. Going back to Adam and his threefold relationship to God in the garden. Adam walked with God. So let's take a look at before the fall. Let's say in the garden. Okay? Adam walked with God. I put it down in a chart form to understand it. So, so he had communion. He would commune and walk and talk with God. The next thing he had was he had a true knowledge of the one and only God of the universe. He had a knowledge of God. And, and I mean, there were no doubt to Adam who made this place. He talked to people now in a university, they're not even sure there is a God. They think evolution, the Big Bang, these things came about by chance. There was no doubt in Adam's mind, he knew. He had a knowledge of God. And the other thing was, Adam had something, spiritual life. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he was a living soul. Beyond just a living body, he had a soul that was alive and vibrant with spiritual life. That's all he had in the garden. Those are wonderful things. But when he disobeyed, the price of the disobedience led to a fall. And he lost all three of those things when you read Genesis 3. Instead of now walking with God, he hid from God. Instead of having a knowledge of God and of truth, he believed a lie and sewed fig leaves together. Sewed fig leaves, made aprons, <coughs> thought he could cover his own sin. That's a lie that the devil tells you. That's not truth. That's not a knowledge of God and of truth. And he was driven out of the garden and he lost his spiritual life. He was spiritually dead. In the, in the sense that if we went out, now it's spring, and we found a beautiful flower out there that's connected to its life source, and we plucked it and cut it off from its life force, it doesn't die instantly. We can take it home and we can put it in a cup of water and it will survive for a while, but it will wither and die. That's what it was like when Adam sinned. He was plucked spiritually from the source, the father of spirits and life, and he was physically alive but spiritually dead. He was dying slowly. And of course we see, and he died in Genesis 5.5. So therefore, anyone that's in Adam, anyone born in a natural body, is in this condition. He's no longer walking with God, he tends to hide from God. 
He no longer really knows God truly and knows truth. He tends to believe lies. And he no longer has spiritual life. He's spiritually dead. And The man, every, our needs are threefold. Big words, but we'll use them. We need to get back to God. We need reconciliation. We need to be reconciled to the one that we're hiding from, that we're no longer walking with. We need truth. We need illumination. We need to know, we need to stop believing lies and walking in darkness. We need illumination. And we need the new birth. We need regeneration. And Jesus says, plainly and clearly, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus provides all three. All three of the needs are met in Christ. Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You see, are we doing okay on time? Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. Middle of your Bible, right after the Psalms, the book of Proverbs, book of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 14. Since the fall and the separation inside of man's heart, there's a knowledge that there's something greater. That's why you see so many religions. We're incurably religious because we're trying to find our way back. And here's what happens. Proverbs chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Ever since the fall, men have found their own way. Notice it's a way. Jesus is the way. This is a way. Jesus gives us the, the true faith. Many people have their own faith. There are many faiths out there. There's one true God. There are false gods. There's one way to God. There are false ways. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man. What the devil has done is put Satan's lie into hearts of men is ever since the garden, you can work your way back to God by covering your sins if you do something good. Religion, you go through this ceremony. You go through this ritual. You go through this sacrament. You go through this fill in the blank. And God will be pleased with it. And Jesus wants to say, no, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end of that way is death. That's not going to work. I am the way. It's not a matter of little man on planet Earth trying to find his way back to God up in heaven. I am the way. I, as God, came down out of heaven. The way is coming down. It's not going up. The way is me condescending. The way isn't men reaching to God. It's God reaching down to men. That's the way. It's completely opposite of all the ways you've come up with. I am the way, Thomas. We talked about the Father's house. I came out of the ivory palaces of the Father's house to reach down and get you at your lowest point. I'm the way. Romans, Paul says, they're all gone out of the way. The natural man by nature goes out of the way. And we see millions on the broad way which leadeth to destruction. And Jesus is the narrow way. I'm the way, Thomas. I'm the way. Not only that, I'm, I'm the truth. I'm the truth. The Father had sent me to reveal the full and the final truth about himself and about the way home. I am the truth. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. After the fall, something happened to our mind and our hearts and our ability not only to, to discern truth, but whether or not we even want to believe it. It, it. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah chapter 9. The Bible says in the Psalms that the wicked go astray speaking lies from the time they're born. 
You see little kids? They do something they ought not to do. You know, with me, it was, you know, getting candy. I used to love candy as a little kid. My father, my father bought these things. I didn't know what they were called. They were malt balls. You know those little malt balls? He used to keep them in this metal cabinet. I was like two and a half or three years old. I would see him eating them. And uh, at the same time, Mom had these smelly things in the closet called mothballs. <laughs> and I, I knew you couldn't eat those. Those were not good. So my dad would eat those malt balls, and, and he would see my little eyes and knew that if, if he went out, I would devour the whole thing before he got back. And he liked them. They were for himself. And, and so he said, these are mothballs. And I, and I go, I can't eat those. But I'd say, Mom, when he would leave, Mom, where are those mothballs? I want some of those. You can't eat mothballs. Well, one day I discovered what they were, and I found them, and I was eating them, and my mother caught me. And, and, and there I was trying to lie. Well, Dad said I could have them. I mean, just like in a moment, just came to me right away. Well, Dad didn't say that. We found out when Dad got home later. But, <laughs> but, but how quickly that lie, where'd that come from? Because we go astray from the time we're born speaking lies. The way of the wicked says darkness. Look at Jeremiah 9. There's something about our heart and lies, our deceitful heart. Jeremiah chapter 9, uh, verse 3. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies. They're not valiant for the truth upon the earth. They proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Verse 3, And they will deceive everyone his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They've taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves, and they commit iniquity. Thy inhabitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. I mean, the fall caused a change in the heart. When we spiritually died and separated from God, we, we went into a darkness where we, we'd more rather believe and hear a lie than we would truth. And Jesus had to tell these men, I am the truth. You have heard many lies from many people around you. You have heard some bits of truth. You've heard a mixture of things. I am the truth. There is no shadow of turning. There is no darkness. I am the truth. And you must receive this teaching. How, how many people receive it today? Again, the young man I was talking to from Somalia. I said, you need to grasp. The, I said, I know my God. You don't know your God. I know my God personally. I talk to him. He talks to me through the Bible. And I know him because I, I shook his hand when I took Jesus as my Savior. That's when I met him, through Jesus Christ. You, you have to, we believe Jesus is a prophet. You must believe he's God's only begotten Son and the Savior. That I cannot believe. That I will not believe. And he'd rather believe the lie of a religion that would tell him to bow down five times a day and pray and do this and try and work a way to heaven. Rather believe the truth that the way has been made by God's Son. And he'll tell his neighbor, he's trying to convert me. It's a blessing. As, <laughs> amen. It won't happen. But that's what happens to the darkened heart. In Ephesians it says, they've, their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God through ignorance because of the blindness in their hearts. Pilate, a man, standing in the midst of a controversy, not even wanting to crucify Jesus, wanted to let him go, but asked him, he said, what is truth? And the truth was standing right before him, and Pilate was expressing the perplexity of multitudes. What is truth? And Jesus would have you to know, I am the truth. Truth is not in a philosophy. It's not in a religious system. Pilate was looking to a political solution. It's not in a political solution. It's not in science. Truth is in a person. The Lord Jesus Christ. I am the truth. What will I do? I'll reveal God to you. And I'll expose you for what you are. Jesus will reveal God and he'll expose men. That's one of the reasons they don't want to be near him. You get in the conversation, you bring up the name of Jesus Christ, and you find people don't want to talk about it. Why? Because at the same time as he's revealing God, he's just exposing the darkness in their hearts. I don't want to talk about that. I like the darkness right now. I don't particularly like what I see in the closet when the light shines. And as long as it's in the dark, I don't have to see the mess in there. The truth is in a person. And not only am I the way and the truth will illuminate so you can have a knowledge of God again, I am the life that can regenerate you. 
The natural man is void of spiritual life. You think in your life before you were saved. We did not have an interest in God. We did not have an interest in the things of God. The greatest thing of God down here is the Holy Bible. How many of you really looked forward to reading the Bible before you were saved? I avoided that book like the plague. I wanted nothing to do. I never looked in the book. I read all kinds of books written by men, but I didn't want to read the one book written by God. I was dead to God. I was dead to the things of God. What's the greatest thing that God's doing down here? He's, he's preaching the gospel to lost sinners to get them saved. What's the greatest need down here on this planet? Is it, is it a new welfare program? Is it, is it a new cure for cancer? No, the greatest need is the salvation of souls. Because life is short, eternity is long. What profits a man if he gains a whole world for his short little temporal life, but he doesn't get eternal life? The greatest need is eternal life through the gospel. And yet, spiritually dead people want nothing to do with it. You won't see them coming to a preaching service where the Bible is preached and Jesus is preached. They'll go to a religious service where a way is taught as they're trying to build their way up. But in a preaching service, it will preach about how God came down to men and God will reach down and save sinners. And they're dead to that. The interest is in temporal life. Let's see, I got the job, saving a little money, looking for the second house, going to do the boat. I got The constant things that occupy temporal, earthly life, not the eternal spiritual truths, not the eternal spiritual things. That's how the natural man is. Christ came the way from heaven with truth, not to fix up the natural man, not to rehabilitate the natural man, not to refine our old life, but to give us a new one, to regenerate us, to give the new birth. John chapter 3, you must be born again. To give spiritual life, born of the Spirit. To give everlasting life, John chapter 5. He that heareth my word and believeth on me hath passed from death to life and now hath everlasting life. To give abundant life, I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly, John chapter 10. To be alive to God. The natural man is alive to self and dead to God and the spiritual man is alive to God and hopefully dead to self. And Jesus came to give that life. And then, then he finishes. I mean, the verse is great, John 14, 6. If all you knew were the first half of the verse, you've got a lot of truth in there. I am the way and the truth and the life. Definite article. The way, the truth, the life, end of story. No substitutes. Not, not truth plus a little more truth. Not way plus a little more way. Not life plus a little more life. It's Christ plus nothing, minus nothing. You get all the truth all the way, all the life you need in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. You don't add circumcision. You don't add baptism. You don't add uh, an apocryphal book. You don't add a new teaching. You don't add the book of Tobias. You don't add anything or the gospel of Barnabas. You, it, it's all contained in the person that Jesus has given to you. The way, that would be enough. And then he, then he puts a comma and he says, or, or a colon, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then he gives complete exclusivity to the teaching. No man cometh to the Father but by me. This isn't just one of many truths. This isn't just one of many ways. This is the only way. You get a hold of that and your heart won't be troubled. Everything I've just taught will apply to you personally. The place is waiting for you. You'll live with the Father and me forever. I'll come to get you myself. There's a mansion waiting. All these come through me, and only me. No one comes any other way. There is no other way. What about all the religions of the world? They're all false. They're all false. They're all inventions of the devil. God, God did not send religion. God sent his son. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He did not give his only begotten religion. He gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that salvation could come through a person the God-man. No man cometh to the Father. Notice, he didn't say no man cometh to God. No man cometh to the Father because the true God of the universe has a Son and He is the Father. And when somebody tells you, oh, He doesn't have a Son, then they don't have the God of the Bible and they don't have the God of the universe. That's Jesus' teaching right there. Christ's exclusive claim to the one way to the Father in heaven, given to these 11 men. 
it comforted their hearts. Does it comfort yours? You know, a lot of people reject this teaching. You know, it's curious. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Turn to John chapter 6. I'll show you something. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Watch how John's gospel breaks down. Getting the big picture on the gospel. It breaks down into three movements. Watch the three movements. John chapters 1 through 6. Jesus teaches about him being the way over a, m a number of different teachings. John chapter 6, verse 59. And these things said he in the synagogue. I am the living bread. As he taught in the synagogue, he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard it, they said this, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Verse 66. And from that time, many of disciples went back and walked no more with him. He's the way, and they wouldn't walk it anymore. There's the first crisis of rejection, as they rejected the way. Turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Jesus teaches... Jesus raises Lazarus. Jesus teaches to the Jews and to the Greeks in the temple. And he teaches that he's the resurrection and the life and that he is, he is the uh, author of life. And he teaches that he's come to give the glory of God and that he will bring forth much fruit as he plants himself in the, in the ground. And he's teaching great truths here. In John 12, verse 36, While ye have the light, believe in the light. Here it is, the second part, illumination. I'll give you truth. Believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them, so they could think on it. Verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles, yet they believed not on him. He gave them the truth, and they believed it not. He was the way, and they walked with him no more. He was the truth, and they believed him not. And then turn to John 19. John 19. Verse 4, Pilate therefore went forth again. He saith unto them, Be, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto the, them, to the people, the, all the folks out there, the Jewish leaders, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he is the life, and they killed him. He's the way, and they walk no more. He's the truth, and they believe him not. He's the life, and they killed him. They put the prince of life to death. The teaching was rejected then. The teaching is rejected by crowds today. But the teaching doesn't change. The Word says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the teaching is Jesus is the way, and the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? How about you? It's Jesus plus nothing and minus nothing. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in Jesus. He is the way and the truth and the life. And He'll take you today. He says, Come unto me, all that you labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The call goes out to the ends of the earth. Will you come today? Will you take Jesus as the way and the truth and the life? Then you will have the promises that these men had in the upper room because this is the New Testament given to those that trust Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the teaching in John chapter 14. Jesus is the great comforter. Because I bowed the knee as a sinner to Jesus as my Savior, my heart is comforted knowing that Jesus loves me and is preparing a place for me. Father, help others to hear this teaching today. Please draw to thy side. Help those to receive your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.